Well, good morning and good afternoon for some. My name is Jennifer Joyce and I am the Regional Vice President of Sales for the Western Territory here at Conducive Technologies, talking with you today about how you can boost your VM performance with ease. Now, this webinar is really broken out into two parts. The first part is the thought leadership portion. And that's where we're just gonna dig in under the hood you know, just get into the technology stack a bit and explain what are some of the I.O. inefficiencies that are occurring to some of the I.O. degradation issues that are happening in the environment, particularly in a virtualized environment. What's really happening under the hood that's stealing some underlying IOPS and throughput that's causing your underlying sub-storage systems to work a little harder than they need to be, and ultimately why you may be experiencing less performance than you should or expect to on your application workloads. Now, uh, there are some inherent I.O. penalties that are occurring, and a couple of them we will shine a spotlight on in today's webinar. And then once we give you that overview, we will uh, give you a no more than a kind of the second part of the webinar, about a 10-minute overview of what our software does to fix that situation. Uh, just a quick sneak peek here, our software is just a set and forget software utility that runs silently in the background on Windows servers, and it is tackling those I.O. inefficiencies that we're going to be talking about today to solve them so that you, we can improve that performance for you and get applications running 30 to 40 percent faster and more efficiently. Usually it's way more than that. Now, obviously, one of the compelling events here is that you can get more performance, more ROI out of your existing environment rather than having to do expensive hardware upgrades and add-ons constantly, uh, just throwing more and more hardware at the problem, which I know we've, we've all fallen into that trap. So this is a really unique 100% software-only solution that can actually solve that problem. Now, uh, then once we've covered those two areas, we will be doing that uh, handoff of the complimentary not for resale NFR copy of our software. That is more than a $500 MSRP value to you after the webinar is over because ultimately the proof is in the pudding. We want you to get your hands on it and try it for yourselves. Now, I am not here solo today. I've got my wingman here with me, Howard Butler. He is the Senior Director of Systems Engineering. And uh, for any of you car fans out there, if you are ever on a one-to-one -one call with Howard, not only does he specialize in accelerating performance in computers, but he is also a race car instructor. Uh, so he will specialize in accelerating uh, not only cars, but also computers. So Howard? Well, thanks very much, Jennifer. Uh, glad to be here this morning with you. And by the way, guys, don't let Jennifer's title fool you. She's quite technical, as you'll see as we get going along here. And, uh, you know, one of the things I did want to mention, Jennifer, is that we do like to make this session, you know, rather interactive. And so you'll notice that there is a Q&A box over there on the left side of the screen. And as we go through the session, guys, feel free to drop in any questions you have, comments, thoughts, and things like that. And we'll either get to them during the course of the conversation uh, of this webinar, or for sure at the very end. So again, Jennifer, thanks very much for inviting me today. Well, thank you, Howard. And uh, so I think we're gonna have a good conversation today. Now, uh, some of you may be just joining in and uh, you've not heard of conducive technologies before and you may be wondering, uh, kind of scratching your head thinking to yourself, well, who are these guys and why in the world do they think they have any thought leadership or credibility to even be speaking on the topic that we're talking about today? Now, I'm not a big fan of a company who spends too much time on this slide, but I also want to know who I'm talking to. So I'm going to get right into the content, uh, but I just want to at least give you a, a little idea of what our street cred is. Uh, we're actually a 38-year old software company, we are the 12th oldest software company in the world. And uh, we originally started out as a company called DiskKeeper. Some of you may have heard of that company. In fact, some of you may have used that software or even still be using it. Um, but about six, seven years ago, the company brought some really revolutionary intellectual property into the marketplace that had absolutely nothing to do with fragmentation. Uh, it was all about how can we reduce noisy I.O.? How can we get rid of that chatty, inefficient I.O., unnecessary? And, and it turns out that that I.O. really is unnecessary in a Windows context, in a virtualized context. And that 30 to 40% of all of the I.O. in that, that virtualized area is just absolutely pure 
noise. It's just stealing IOPS, stealing throughput, stealing resources. And in fact, uh, our customers who do deploy us and really take advantage of our software are offloading upwards of 50% or more of the I.O. from their storage subsystem and getting two times faster gains. Now, for the work that we did, uh, Gartner named us Cool Vendor of the Year when we launched the software into the marketplace. And uh, we've now had it out there for six, seven years now, and uh, it's had a really nice market growth. We're used by over 2,500 mid-market to large enterprise customers, and um, also very, various iterations of, and pieces of our technology are OEM'd by some of the really big players out there, the Samsungs, Lenovo's, Western Digitals of the world. So if you haven't heard us, you've clearly heard of them, and we have those close relationships as well with Microsoft and VMware. Um, now, this is, I think, in the bottom right corner is probably one of the biggest, most important things we've, we've uh, got on here. And Howard, I know you were closely involved with this initiative a little while back with Microsoft, but they named us the first ever, and I believe the only software vendor certified for their SQL IO reliability programs, and that was a big deal. You know, you're right, Jennifer, and, and I consider this a, a really nice elite type of certification. You know, Microsoft does have certain levels to make sure that other applications, you know, like ourselves, are fully compatible with their software. In this particular case, we're talking about SQL Server. And as you said, we're the only software vendor among in this list. But we're a really good company, I think. You know, like you mentioned, the people like uh, EMC and Dell and HP and so forth. Um, and besides all the testing, you know, that we had to go through. Um, we also were subjected to a, a large panel list of, of SQL experts to be peppered with a lot of questions about our technology, how it works, what it does. Um, and I really do think that this was a really neat, um, very elite type certification. So uh, thanks for asking that question, Jennifer. Yeah, thanks, Howard. And I mean, the fact that we're the only software vendor that's ever gotten this too, I mean, that's really neat. Um, so I want to jump into the thought leadership portion of this and explain a little bit about what's happening and what's creating all this noise, this unnecessary IO traffic. Uh, you know, what, what really is the cause of this IO degradation issue that's stealing that performance? Um, so let me just first give you guys this opening slide real quick, some market research that we've done that you might find interesting. Now, Earlier in the year, we conducted what we believe is one of the largest independent studies done on I.O. performance. Over 1,000 IT professionals had responded, um, and we asked one very pointed question, uh, you know, is that now that, that organizations have virtualized and added or replaced hardware, we wanted to know, do you still have applications that are tough to support from a system performance standpoint? You know, just slow queries, slow performance, batch jobs taking too long. Uh, well, over half, in fact, 60% of organizations came back and said that they are still having such performance troubles. Evidently, all flash hasn't made that kind of stuff go away. Um, and we understand why this is, and we're going to get into that in this webinar and show you the root cause of what is robbing that performance. Now, uh, the funny thing is, is we've done this exact same survey the previous two years, in fact, I think we've we're done it more than that, um, but this number continues to slowly worsen. Uh, so last year it was 55%, and so you can kind of see that there's a slow creep of IR performance gap between what's being demanded from applications and what the underlying storage and server storage is able to actually deliver on IO performance. So the likelihood that you're in this webinar because you're in that 60% it's pretty high, so just letting you know you are in good company. Um, people are still ha struggling with this, still asking these questions despite all of the advancements in hardware. Uh, so, you know, the other thing that we wanted to know too is that we asked, what are the kind of the one or two applications that are causing the most trouble? And we did a word cloud uh, across these hundreds of responses, and you can kind of see what rose to the top here. Uh, we really have uh, SQL getting mentioned predominantly the most, uh, SharePoint, um, CRM type applications exchange, ERP, and so on. So it's, it's those really high I.O. type applications that are really suffering that big degradation. And the fact is that some 30 to 40 percent of performance is being robbed by what's happening at the Windows level by small fractured random I.O. generated by the Windows operating system, which will slow down these applications even if you throw all of this shiny new hardware at the problem. Um, so we're going to get into this a little bit. 
Okay, so let's let's get into that right now. So so first, I want to jump in onto this next slide, and I think the setup here was long enough. Um, before I give you a picture of what's actually occurring or creating these IO degradations issues that I'm talking about, I think it helps to start with a view of what actually a healthy IO profile looks like. What is an optimal IO profile? What are you really going for to get that optimal performance? And as you can see, oh, I have an advanced slide. Let me um, I thought I had. Let me. Good, now it took. So as you can see here, um, uh, what's happening is that, you know, in, in, this, in this slide, we're obviously dealing with the rudimentary extraction, a kind of an oversimplification of what an environment would look like and what's actually happening in it. Um, but I think that the takeaway is pretty obvious and immediate. So what you can see here is that in the ideal state, what we're going for is that you want large sequential I.O. You want I.O. traffic that looks like this. Now, this would be optimal. And this would get you the best performance from your underlying flash hybrid or disk storage. So, you know, the moment that you take any, any environment and virtualize it, you're going to get this compounding effect um, of some of the problems I was talking about. But also, you want to be able to have a smooth thing that looks a lot like this. Now, what's actually happening is that you have an environment that actually this is what's happening in, okay? So taking a quick look at this, you can also see, I think, the immediate takeaway is that suddenly now you've got this environment where there's these IO characteristics which are really small, they're fractured, they're randomized, um, and ultimately the environment is having to work a lot harder than it normally would. Now, this, this I really like to refer to as the IO blender effect in that bottom section of the slide that you can see there. And I'm going to just share a, a quick story with you for a customer that we just wrapped up a proof of concept with, Howard and I did last week. Um, they ended up going through what I refer to as the three levels of deployment, and I'll define that a little bit more later in the webinar, but to suffice it to say the first level uh, was they deployed just to the servers they cared about, just the ones they were trying to make their SLAs on. Now, in their particular environment, they had 120 SQL servers sitting on a six-host cluster, and what we did was we deployed just to about 10 VMs, and I told them up front, you're probably not going to get the full result you want because of this IO blender effect down here. Um, we may be able to optimize the data streams just from those servers, but they've got a bunch of noisy neighbors. So sure enough, the first month, uh, they had been missing this SLA every month for a year, and they got our software in there on just the critical servers. They made their SLA for the first time in a year by three minutes. Trial were expired. The next month, they missed their SLA again, and they missed it by five minutes. Uh, the next month, we went ahead and extended their trial for them, and we went and we insisted, you got to go to all your servers to get rid of this IO blunder effect in your environment. They went to 100 of their 120 SQL servers, and they made the SLA again on that critical server by 17 minutes because they got rid of all that neighboring noisy IO from all the other VMs. So you can certainly get a lot of gains from just going to your targets, and that's a great place to start. You can also exponentially add a force multiplier by that to that by handling the I.O. in the whole environment. So that's kind of a really good illustration of what the I.O. blender effect is and what it means. Now, uh, most organizations don't feel the full performance penalty that comes with virtualization because when they virtualized, you know, it does add complexity to stay the path, but when they virtualized, they did so slowly over time. And that kind of like I just described with this, this proof of concept that we just finished is they didn't quite feel it. They couldn't tell where the drag was coming from. The one SLA they really cared about was obviously getting heavily drugged down by the, the noisy I.O. from all of the other VMs that had technically nothing to do with that direct workload. Um, and Howard, I know that you had a, an experience with this because a lot of people we've experienced went virtual over time and you've you got VM creep, you just out of VM here, you out of VM here. Collectively, you don't notice that creep starting to come in as more and more load gets put on the environment. Um, but Howard, we had a unique case with uh, Chris's Health where they went literally virtual overnight with thousands of servers and you were involved closely with that. Can you give us that example? You know, they did. Um, they did their testing on individual systems. And, you know, kind of what they expected was that when they did go from physical to virtual platforms, they'd get the same kind of performance. But unfortunately, what they got was something far less than what they were expecting. You know, what they saw was a huge performance degradation. And in their analysis, what they found is that it wasn't CPU, it wasn't memory related. It truly was IO bottlenecks that were creeping in, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And that's what caused their issue there. Now, their first reaction was, like most of us would think, 
we're going to have to upgrade all of our storage here, and we're going to have to go to an all-flash array to kind of solve this type of I.O. tsunami that, that's occurring. Um, but before they did that, they got a copy of our software. Um, they installed it. We worked with them and so forth. And they discovered that, yeah, our software did indeed solve their I.O. performance bottleneck issues. So, Jennifer, rather than them spending $2 million on hardware for all that new flash-type storage array, we were able to save them from doing that. Yeah, and we actually have a published case study with them on this, and um, Howard and I had a chance to have dinner with them not so long ago, and I, I asked them, I'm like, was this a true story? And they said straight up, it, we had the PO for $2 million sitting on the CIO's desk for signature. We threw your software out there, and a week later, we told them to cancel it. Um, and they were, they were mid-cycle on that hardware. They weren't even at end of life on it. So um, just a really, really important aspect uh, that when it's a software issue creating that I.O. degradation and that performance degradation, more hardware isn't going to solve it. Getting it at the root source is really going to be the way to go. Um, so, you know, there's another thing that, that this is, I think, probably the best kept secret in uh, the, the VMware um, performance recommendations manual. Um, but what I did was I, I pulled this from VMware's best practices guide, and they were talking about improving I.O. performance. And this is right from the vSphere 6.5 best practices guide, uh, and it, it highlights two ways to improve I.O. performance. Now, one is obviously to increase virtual memory, and that makes a lot of sense. Two, as VMware says here, is to defragment the file system on all guests. Now, as we spoke about before, you don't want to defragment on SSDs or SAN. Um, you know, you're, you're going to flash the cells multiple times on SSDs, possibly shortening the life cycle of them on a SAN. You may have a lot of things like dedupe, uh, change block tracking, compression, whatever you have, and any time a file writes, all those dominoes fall again. Defragging makes those dominoes fall a second time. So you're not going to want to defragment in those environments, but, but yet uh, here's a very clear acknowledgement by VMware that fragmentation is an issue. So how do you solve it? <laughs> well, we're the only ones sitting on um, sitting in the Windows OS environment preventing fragmentation. We have the only solution that can get ahead of this and create a situation where no fragmentation is occurring in the first place and prevent it at the outset. So in essence, VMware is really saying you need a solution like Velocity in your environment because we're the only ones preventing the fragmentation from occurring before it even happens. Problem solved. And by the way, these two items are mentioned. We, we, maybe we've missed a time or two, but we've counted 17 times in this best practice guide that these recommendations are mentioned. So it is very, very important. Um, so now, how do we do this? Where do we sit? And uh, how, you know, I've been mentioning that we are a software-only solution. So. As I mentioned, uh, we are basically light filter driver software, and the orange bar that you see there right in the OS is where we sit. So we sit above everything else uh, in the environment, above the hypervisor, above the servers, above the network, above storage. And so, you know, folks, if it is compatible with Windows, it is going to be compatible with this because we are fenced by the Windows operating system. So again, it doesn't matter what else is in your environment, whatever type of hardware you have, it does not matter. As long as it is compatible with Windows, we will be sitting there optimizing the I.O. stream down to storage and back again. Howard, is there anything you want to add on to that? No, I think that covers it really well. I mean, it, as you pointed out, it certainly makes us hardware agnostic to the environment. Um, you know, a, a problem that is creeping in is related to the file system. A software uh, solution is the best solution to, to try to address this type of problem. That's great. Now, I do expect the part, we're going to go into part two of the webinar here. We're going to talk about the actual solution. And this is where, Howard, I expect that we're just going to start getting some questions. So uh, that Q&A box is there. Let's have those questions as you are thinking them. Start popping those into the box now. Other people will feed off of your questions. And chances are as well that if you're thinking the question, someone else is thinking it as well. We're going to have the Q&A uh, right at the bottom of the hour. And we may even be able to take a question or two in the flow of the webinar as we're going. Um, so what we have here is um, taking a look at what are we doing about this. So 
as I mentioned, we just give you this quick, you know, high level, how do you, how do you solve this? And then we'll talk to you about getting that NFR handed off to you and how you can download that seamlessly in your environment in about five minutes and start seeing the benefits of velocity right away. Now, again, it's set and forget software that installs right into the Windows operating system. As I mentioned, it's a very thin filter driver. It is nominal overhead. We call it near zero overhead impact. And we challenge you to even see the CPU footprint. It's enormously lightweight. So, um, the CPU resources it does use runs at the lowest priority. It's never interfering with your server performance. And what the software is doing is actually offloading I.O. from the underlying storage. And then at the same time, whatever I.O. does remain, uh, we're streamlining that I.O. traffic. So it's a friendly I.O. profile to your storage to process. It's much, much quicker. And we do a couple of different things. Um, we have two patented engines within the software. And I'll just give you a quick highlight of what those look like. Um, so the first one, is called IntelliWrite. And, you know, Howard, I think uh, this, is, this is probably your, more your wheelhouse. Let me, uh, let me ask you to give a very brief overview of what the IntelliWrite engines do. Sure. So what we're trying to do here is dealing with the behavior of the Windows file system. It doesn't really know what the ultimate size of a file is going to be. It doesn't spend any time looking for the best possible fit. It only knows what is the next available allocation at the logical disk layer. Um, and by providing Windows the necessary information it needs to know where are the larger chunks of free space, we can coach or help Windows better choose the appropriate location for when writing the data. So rather than getting these tiny little fractured split IOs, as Microsoft likes to refer to them, uh, also known as fragmentation. But the behavior of Windows, if it just grabs the first available free space, but your application is trying to write, let's say, a megabyte of data, well, you know a megabyte of data just can't fit into that little tiny segment of space. So Windows will allocate the first, let's say, 4 KB, write what it can, create a separate I.O. Uh, request that grabs the next available free space, and you continue down that path where you know, writing a megabyte of data could take literally dozens of individual separate I.O. requests, which all takes a substantial more amount of time. So if we can coach Windows into allocating a larger chunk of free space that more likely fits the size of the file, then you avoid creating all those unnecessary writes. And as a result, um, you have fewer I.O.s hitting the storage device. Great. Thank you very much, Howard. Appreciate, uh, appreciate you covering that. And it, it really is an interesting thing because what ends up happening is when this engine is deployed, it is, um, it is removing 30 to 40 percent of all of the write I.O. that would normally be generated. So you still write a gig of data, you just write it with 30 percent, 40 percent less I.O. So if it was going to take 100,000 I.O.s to write a gig of data, it now only takes 70,000 I.O.s. And when you start adding that up across the boards of all of the work you're doing in your whole environment, that really, really starts to add up. And another thing I'll mention, too, is that when it writes clean, it reads clean. Uh, so that's where we're, you know, this is replacing that old school defragmentation. This is getting ahead of it. This is preventing it. And this answers the call in that earlier VMware document that I highlighted saying, hey, you guys need to be defragmenting your VMs. This is how you get it done and still be compatible with your entire hardware environment. Um, Howard, anything else you wanted to add on? If not, I'll, I'll move on to the next item. Well, you know, I kind of like to use this analogy. You know, let's suppose you wanted to, I don't know, carry a gallon of water from one place to another. You know, you could do that with 128 individual little Dixie cups filled with one ounce of water and go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Or imagine if you just had all that water in one giant gallon jug. You could just take it in one motion going from one side of the room to the next. So I really just think, you know, kind of keeping that in mind is what we're enforcing or helping Windows to do a better job of. And the results are you get nice sequential writes, which is going to be far more efficient and more optimal. Great. And normally we have about three or four or five questions by now. So if anyone's got one, like you're typing it out, and you're just not sure about hitting send, go ahead and throw it out there because there usually are some really good questions here. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to the next um, 
the next portion here. Now I mentioned that there were two engines, two major filter drivers, and uh, so you know the net takeaway here is that with the uh, the first one that we talked about, that intelligence is really helping Windows find that best allocation at the logical layer, uh, since you know the next available space rarely, if ever, is the right size for those rights. So now let's talk about this other engine. This is the, the DRAM read caching engine. It's called IntelliMemory. And this is where we're establishing what we refer to as a tier zero cache strategy in your environment by simply leveraging the idle available DRAM sitting there on any given VM or physical server for that matter, because you may still have some stragglers there. Um, and especially like those physical servers tend to be really big I.O. and they're still tying back into that same back-end storage and that would be contributing to that I.O. blender effect even if those workloads aren't virtualized. So what we want to do is we want to take the memory at any of those servers and this also, guys, is really important for VDI as well. Um, it tends to be really high density and, uh, you know, most VDI environments are now provisioned more, with more than four gigs per VM. We can take that and offload all of that traffic, serve it directly from memory uh, that's otherwise normally just sitting there idle and free it's otherwise going unused and wasted, and we're using that portion to serve hot reads. Now, now the real genius of the engine is that it is completely automatic and dynamic. You don't have to carve out or allocate any extra memory for the cache, as the software is aware moment by moment of how much memory is being used by other applications, and we will only use the free and available portion to serve hot reads, and, and we will dynamically adjust. So if it gets called for by something else, we back out, release pages, and it's checking every second. We never get in the way. You're never going to drop into memory starvation or paging or anything like that because we're using and borrowing that memory on a dynamic basis. Now, um, the uh, that's about all I have to say about it, Howard. Um, I just am thinking the only other thing I would probably mention is that serving from memory, one of the big advantages of that is that it is usually 10 to 15 times faster than going from an SSD, uh, and it does not take a lot of memory, because that, that's the other thing too, is let me just talk about being capacity intensive. Someone may be used to like a SQL server hogging all the memory, right, and taking it up. That's not the case here. Um, it does not take a lot of memory for us to be highly effective. So just with, you know, sometimes just four gigs of free memory, which most systems have sitting there, we're able to serve 25 plus percent of the hot, tiny, small, noisy read I.O. directly from that, that memory. Um, so Howard, let me, let me come over to you and see uh, anything else that you might want to add on to the explanation that I've been providing here. Well, I certainly think you touched on, on a couple of the key points there, Jennifer. You know, uh, what really kind of makes our IntelliMemory caching rather e unique, and one of the reasons why, you know, nine of the top ten PC manufacturers has licensed our technology. You know, and of course you probably haven't heard of us maybe because they license those products under their own name. But the two things that you indicate is dynamic memory usage. And, you know, we're only going to use what's free and available. Um, and not using any of that other system memory that if, if it's called upon by other applications, like you mentioned, we certainly give it back uh, without uh, causing any type of memory starvation. The second part, and, and perhaps where I can add a little more um, uh, background data on, is the intelligence of our caching. You know, many caching strategies just simply populate the cache with every single thing they possibly can think of, and then figure out what to keep and what to throw away. We don't bother with that. What we actually look at is, based upon the behavior of your applications, the repetitiveness of that data, and the likelihood that solving those IOs now and in the future, resolving them directly from memory would result in a, in a performance benefit. Those are the criteria that we look at to determine what to put into cash, what to keep in cash for how long um, in, in terms of improving overall system performance. So there's, there's a significant amount of intelligence um, relying on our software to ensure that you get the best possible performance from the least amount of memory being used. Thank you, Howard. 
And uh, do you see we have a couple of questions? We'll be getting to those just uh, in a minute um, about the write optimization. If you have any questions about the, uh, the read caching we've been talking about, please drop those in now. We're going to shift gears here and kind of go in the home stretch of uh, the content of the webinar before we get to the Q&A and the handoff of the NFR. Um, I did want to just give you a view real quick of what uh, our UI looks like, and we also have a, a uh, management console which can globally manage the software. I don't have a screenshot of that, but this is the uh, UI and just one individual install. So if you're wondering what the typical results look like, uh, this is a median. Um, so this is from the time saved dashboard in the product, and it shows how many IOs are eliminated from going to storage, what percentage of your read and write traffic is offloaded, and how much time that saves. This is an average for uh, systems that have at least four gigs of available DRAM, and you can see here that um, that you know with the um, right optimization, that fragmentation prevention we were talking about, we average 30 percent, and the read optimization we average 50 percent. So the 64 percent here you see here is a little above average mileage varies. Could be a little lower, could be a little higher. Um, so this screenshot is a really good representation. Um, this one was taken from an ERP system with the SQL backend sitting on hybrid storage from a live production environment that a customer sent over to us. And um, this particular customer was the EB group and they saw over five hours of IO time saved after running it for just a couple of weeks. Um, so that was pretty neat. Uh, for them it meant about a 50% boost uh, for their users. Now. Uh, there's another one here that I wanted to highlight, and, and now we're getting into kind of some hard testing numbers. This is from the University of Illinois. These are actual results, uh, and they do have a published case study with us, but this is kind of nice to get in under the hood of exactly, okay, you're saying this can really help, especially in a flash environment, virtualized environment, show me. So in this particular one, this application running on their, was running on an Oracle database running in Windows, and just to clarify, I think I mentioned this earlier, but this is a Windows-only solution. Um, I know a lot of Oracles running out there not in Windows, so it's got to be a Windows server. And uh, in this particular case, um, this database managed not only their work orders, but the card swipes of 50,000 students and faculty in the dorms, food halls, et cetera. They virtualized it. Uh, they were running on VMware. Uh, they put in a brand new Dell 730 servers. Six, uh, they had 768 gigs of RAM on it, all brand new uh, flash compellent storage. And this is the result of a 72-hour window before uh, we benchmarked. And then they, uh, you know, and again, we're sitting on all flash, uh, these big Dell servers, and this is before Velocity was installed. The application generated 13.9 million IOs going down to disk, and it took four hours to complete the job. Now, fast forward 72 hours with Velocity installed, and that 13.9 million IOs to disk went down to 2.7 million IOs. And that four hours of runtime went down to an hour and 16 minutes. And not only that, but in that hour and 16 minutes, we managed to process yet another half terabyte. So the data loads went up, the data set went up significantly, and we still had that processed in the hour and 16 minutes. Um, and as Howard was mentioning about our patented caching engines, you know, it's kind of the secret sauce that the number of the cache hits, the number of the IOs that didn't have to take the trip down to storage and back again delivers this kind of time savings and allowed them to process much more data, um, you know, in that hour and 16 minutes. They were completely blown away. And we see stuff like this all the time. Again, mileage varies, um, but this is not atypical uh, for the kinds of, kind of results that we see. And you can kind of get another feel for that with this, uh, this um, data sheet here from other examples. We've already mentioned Christus Health in the upper left corner. They had that $2 million PO they were able to cancel. The guys right in the middle, Out Low Brinkin Company, a manufacturing company using Epicor as their ERP, I was lucky enough to personally do that deployment with them. They had 32 servers in the environment. They were sitting on a uh, quote for a quarter million dollar SAN upgrade, and they were able to cancel it as well um, because we were able to solve and resolve their performance issues within the week, but just by deploying our software. Um, ASL marketing was another deployment I did where we dropped the SQL batch imports, which were supposed to be quote unquote overnight. Well, 27 hour import is not overnight. We installed our software and they got it down to 12 hours. 
Um, and then the upper right corner is interesting, Creative Office Pavilion. They were suffering from what I like to call the Windows shadow effect. <laughs> it's, and I, I just had another POC wrap up recently about the same size as these guys. Um, these guys have, you know, they're kind of like a two to three host shop, anywhere from 15 to 20 VMs. And what happens in those types of environments is people have, you know, kind of users get dropped and they get disk error alerts coming in and things like that. Those tend to all just go away and the environment just stabilizes and smooths out. Uh, when our software goes in. And you wouldn't normally think that that kind of stuff would go away because of reducing 30 to 40 or 50 percent of the I.O. from the environment and streamlining and sequentializing it, but it does. Um, and uh, Howard, that reminds me real quick, I know I'm going just a little bit over, but I think this is an important point. I think you had read some research on sequential versus random I.O., right? Well, that is true. Um, you'll notice that practically all disk storage manufacturers any benchmarking tool uh, reports both on sequential and random read and write requests. And one of the things you're going to find is that sequential reads always outperform random reads and writes. So, you know, that just goes to add credibility to what we're trying to say in the terms of if we can help Windows reduce the amount of I.O. traffic and make the I.O. requests more sequential and larger in size rather than these tiny, random, fragmented pieces or, or fractured pieces, um, you tend to get your work done much faster. And Howard, you just reminded me of something I had wanted to bring up earlier when you are talking about getting your work done much faster. Um, what we really are focusing on here, because I've had people say, hey, I mean, I literally had this question asked of me. They said, we have 600,000 IOPS on an all-flash pure SAN, and we're only using 2% of our IOPS capacity. You're talking about reducing I.O. We're still missing our SLAs. What could you possibly do for us? Why would reducing I.O. help us? That's literally a real question I was asked. And the answer that I gave back to them was, we aren't focused on the 600,000 IOPS capacity that you have. We're focused on the part you're using. So what if you're only using 1% of that or less? What we're looking at is how efficiently is that 1% being used? And we can make that 30 to 40% faster. And that particular customer also did a POC with us. Um, they only, and this is how heavy their workloads were, they had 11 physical servers attached to that SAN and nothing else. They hadn't even virtualized. They wanted to have as little complexity in the environment as possible. They deployed us to one VM. It didn't work. They deployed us to all 11 VMs, and they were able to cut four hours off their data warehouse time. And they were able to shave 15 minutes off their SQL batch, and that 15 minutes is what they needed to get them under their SLAs. So it's, you know, let's not be fooled kind of by the the lure, of the, the siren call of, of flash and, and fast and IOs and all of that because at the end of the day, if it's messed up at the top of the stack and it's coming down as garbage, it's going to just overwhelm the, the sand. So again, we're not worried about the overhead uh, capacity that you have. It's like if I walk into a room, um, you know, I'm five foot three and maybe it's got 20 foot ceilings and there's 15 feet of space above me and that's a crowded room. I can't use that 15 feet of space above me to navigate that room. I'm stuck down here in the five to six feet of space where everybody else is as well. So what Velocity is basically doing is walking into that room and saying, hey, could, could half of you leave? Thanks. And then it's saying, hey, could the rest of you get in lines and sequentialize yourselves? Thanks. Now I'm going to be able to walk right through that room. Forget about the 15 feet of space above me. It's that five feet of space down here that I'm using, and that's what we're optimizing. Um, now, we're going to go ahead and, and get into um, the, uh, the handoff of the, the NFR. I know we've run a bit over. The session is recorded, so if you do have to drop, please don't, don't hesitate. We will send you a recording of the link, and you will still get your NFR. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more use cases here. There's use case after use case after use case of these types of benefits that we've been talking about. Um, so you can check out that slide when you get the, uh, when you get the, um, the send of the presentation to you. But uh, I do want to go right into how to evaluate the software. Okay, so um, what you want to do, and I, I alluded to this earlier, um, so specifically if you're going to be deploying to SQL servers, you're going to want to uh, put a limit on how much memory SQL can use and leave a bunch left on the OS side, but whatever you leave on the OS side we'll be able to use as well. If this is particularly a big, heavy SQL server with hundreds of gigs of RAM and, and that kind of thing, you're going to want to leave at least 16 gigs on the, the, the uh, OS side, um, if not more. But 
typically most servers, four to eight gigs, you're going to get all the benefit you need. Most environments we deploy to, um, we may look at hundreds of servers and there's less than 20 that we'll, we'll recommend any memory adjustments on at all. Um, so it's mostly a one size fits all kind of deployment. And then you monitor the Velocity dashboard. Now you have um, a couple of different options here. We are going to be sending you uh, and just a reminder, we are going to wrap up shortly. We only have a couple questions, so if you do have any questions uh, pending, go ahead and start dropping those in now so that we make sure we answer those. Um, once we answer all the questions in the box, we will end the webinar. Um, so what we want to do is really look at what your next steps are. So you have a couple of options here. Um, one is that we do have a free I.O. health check tool. You can use to see if your servers are even a candidate. You do not have to install any software or agents on your target servers, so there should be very easy change control there. Nothing's getting installed. How we get the data is we're using uh, remote WMI calls to collect existing PerfMon data off those target servers. Um, so that's a really great place to start. One of our engineers can hop on a phone and give you a quick 5-10 minute assessment to see if those servers are candidates or not in the first place. Um, the second thing you can do is you can take the NFR we're going to be sending you and you can deploy it to a server. Uh, it's good for one server, physical or virtual, and then come back in and monitor the dashboard if it's SQL to make sure you've put the memory limits in place that we recommended. The third option is that you can get a trialware. The trialware includes the Velocity Management Console, which by the way, if you purchase the product, is included for free. Uh, and you're able to deploy that trial to all of the servers, just like that customer I mentioned at the early part of the webinar. They went to 100 VMs and man, did they get the result. Um, so, so those are your options, and with the trial where, um, again, it's unlimited. You can deploy it to all of your VMs in your environment, or all of the VMs on a host, or all the VMs in an application suite. Now, to get your hands on the, the Velocity Management Console or the I.O. Assessment Tool, uh, you, ha you can type in both. So those will be extra sends. We will send everyone the NFR. Um, but if you would like the IOAT only, just type in IOAT, IO Assessment Tool. If you would like the VMC, the Velocity Management Console, which gives you that expanded trial, just type in VMC. And if you would like both, just type in both into the Q&A box, and we will make sure we get those to you after the webinar. Okay, so Howard, we do have two questions here. Um, Tony asks, if we have multiple VMs that have dedicated network card ports on a host to talk to a SAN on, VM, on a VMs of high traffic access, does your software have benefits for those VMs high traffic on multiple network I.O. communications? Absolutely, we do provide benefit there. So, Tony, that's a great question. And, you know, it alludes to the fact that, you know, you have this very robust hardware environment that where the the guest VMs have the ability to talk directly to the SAN storage, but they're not passing their request on as efficiently as they could because of the Windows file system. And if we can help the Windows file system be more efficient and do a better job, then it's going to be sending fewer I.O. requests through those network cards to your back-end SAN storage so the, the idea is that the fewest number of IOs is really going to uh, win the race, and that's where we're going to be able to provide performance gains there. Plus, a substantial amount of your IO traffic is likely to be reads, and those reads can be satisfied directly from DRAM inside that virtual machine. And DRAM to DRAM or memory to memory type data transfers are 10 to 15 times faster than going to an SSD. So clearly there will be substantial benefit in, in your particular environment. Okay, great. Thank you, Howard. Now, Adrian asks a very interesting question. Is there any benefit to DFAT? Oh, I think, Jennifer, we lost your audio there. Um, so I'll pick up there. And Adrian, you were asking a question on, is there any benefit to defragmenting with flash drives? So I'm going to actually rephrase your question just a little bit there, uh, Adrian. It's not really about defragmenting. It is about fragmentation avoidance. If we can help Windows write the data such that it never fragmented in the first place, guess what? You have the smoothest, best type of I.O. traffic you can possibly have. And because the data isn't being broken up into all these little tiny pieces, you're not having to defrag. So it's really more about I.O. avoidance, fragmentation avoidance, and defrag really isn't something that we have to focus on, but in those rare extreme cases where 
there's already a significant amount of fragmentation that's causing a performance problem. Yes, there is benefit in being able to clean those files up, but we don't have to clean up every single file because not all files are causing a performance problem. We focus on the ones that are, that are going to derive a benefit. Howard, I'm back. Okay, great. Hey, that's live TV, right? <laughs> it is live TV. Um, so uh, were you just still wrapping up on Adrian's uh, flash question? I think question I, I had wrapped up on Adrian's question there, so we can go on to Nathan's. Okay. Um, so Nathan's question is, uh, have you ever deployed this on a Citrix environment? If so, what was the result? So Nathan, yes, we have. In fact, Howard and I just got off the phone with one of our existing customers yesterday to review um, their deployment. They have us on 224 servers in their environment. Half of them are not Citrix and half of them are. And the results are fantastic. They're just right in that sweet spot because, because what we're really looking at is the fact that it does, it's really, whether it's Citrix or not, it's Windows. This is a universal behavior in Windows and it treats all applications and all files in a fairly consistent manner. Um, of course, mileage varies depending on how the application is written, but yes, we, we see very, very, very good results. Um, across the boards and especially in Citrix. And we were just looking at a set of 100 servers yesterday. And you guys may, may be getting the sense that we're really involved with our customers. Um, when somebody does invest in our software, um, first, we do give them a very full experience on the proof of concept. We're there every step of the way, and we also help build out your ROI case. But once you do invest in the software, we're there after you invest in it to make sure you've fully deployed. And then we also provide you with a technical executive summary to hand back off to management afterwards to go, hey, that investment we made, we've got it deployed, and here's the benefit we're getting from it. So you're going to have a very full experience with our software, not only on your servers, but off of your servers as well with your account management team. Um, so let me see if there's any other questions in here. Um, I, and Howard, before I go on, is there anything else you want to add on to the Citrix question? No, I think that covered it, covered it well. Okay, great. So we are actually out of questions. Adrian's got a question about where's the link. Adrian, everybody on the call will be emailed uh, very shortly after a re webinar replay. Uh, as soon as WebEx has rendered that, we'll get that link off to you from our marketing team. And then our marketing team will also be personally emailing you those links. So check your spam filter if you haven't received it by the end of the day. Um, and you can always email back into the team to say, I haven't gotten it yet. But you will be then, once you have the link, be able to set up your account. Um, and that software will be waiting there for you to download. So guys, we really appreciate your time and attention on the webinar today. We're going to wrap it up. Howard, thank you very much for attending and for your technical expertise as well. All righty. My pleasure, Jennifer. You have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay. Take care, everyone.